decisions made by us will always be for the betterment and greater happiness of all our fellow citizens. So help us God. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk please call the roll? Alderman O'Brien. Present. Alderman Gidge. Alderman Harriet Gathright. Present. Alderman Dowd. Present. Alderman Clee. Here. Alderman Laws. Alderman Lopez. Alderman Karen. Here. Alderwoman Kelly. Here. Alderman Jetty. Here. Alderwoman Melisi Gola. Present. Alderman Tenza. Present. Alderman Schmidt. Here. Alderman Clemens. Alderman Wilshire. Here. We have 11 members present, but we'll note that Alderman Lopez just arrived. Thank you. Also joining us this evening is Mayor Donches and Corporation Counsel Stephen Bolton. Does the mayor wish to address the board? Uh, yes, Madam President. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who was involved in yesterday's Memorial Day parade. Uh, the Veterans Committee did a great job in putting the parade on. We had a number of aldermen come and march in the parade, which was really, really great. The weather was fantastic. The crowds were, I think, more than usual. So I think overall it was a, a great tribute to our service people and the veterans from Nashua and throughout the region that uh, we were honoring and, and holding the parade. So I want to thank everybody, everybody involved. Um, on an issue that has been in the news recently, if you read the New York Times on Sunday, in the front page, cities hijacked by tools stolen from the NSA, Baltimore is extorted. And what this is about is a malware, which they call Eternal Blue, which is being used by bad actors around the globe to try to penetrate the security IT systems of cities and towns and private institutions as well, businesses and the like, and to try to extort money uh, in exchange for them giving up uh, their what they're doing. So what, what happens is they use this eternal blue, eternal blue malware to get into a system, an IT system, and completely shut operations down. Baltimore has been hit in the last, recently, Atlanta, back a ways, many other, other cities and towns have been attacked, and when this happens, the cost can be very, very considerable. And, of course, the uh, disruption also very considerable. So I, I want the Board of Aldermen to know that we are, because you might have read these same articles, that the city is actively working to prevent our system from being penetrated or compromised by this or any other ran uh, malware, ransomware, or anything else. Uh, maybe we want, if you want to, we could set up a meeting with uh, Bruce Catignone, who is the director of IT, and others to talk about some of the details, but the and as an overview, we block our system blocks known malicious IP addresses. Uh, those are regularly circulated by Homeland Security. There's a very effective firewall that prevents suspicious emails and other traffic from getting into the city system. Uh, there's a subscription to a service which notifies us of zero-day threats. In other words, if a flaw in a software system is discovered elsewhere, which is somehow penetrated, before a patch is developed, we, the city, get notice that this has occurred so that we can here act to block anything that might come in before it is, before there's a, a patch developed that can uh, permanently block that that threat. There is malware detection software on all the PCs. There's antivirus software. And the city receives 
security patches when a flaw in a software system that we operate is discovered elsewhere. Um, the users, in other words, our employees, are asked to report suspicious emails so that they can be investigated. Uh, and there is, because there is a practice that has been, is often used called phishing, which puts an email into someone's box which looks like something official, like it might say, uh, click here to, uh, to update and confirm your, your username and, and password. But that would never come from a city, a legitimate city source, because no one would ever ask you. IT would never ask someone, put, you know, put your password in an email. And uh, that did result, and it was reported in the newspaper, a phishing expedition, a successful one over at the school department where some, maybe a year ago, some payroll was stolen from a few employees who were duped into responding to one of these emails, these phishing emails. Uh, that money, of course, was, was restored by risk, but was, was lost to the city as a result of uh, the, the s details of the scheme. But, there is phishing training. In other words, IT puts out phishing emails to our own employees to make sure that they don't respond. And if they do respond to a suspicious email that, that we, the city, creates, they are then asked to undergo more training regarding how to detect suspicious emails. Uh, there, we get regular Homeland Security updates. Uh, Bruce Canignone is part of the cybersecurity subcommittee of the S state IT department, where he gets a lot of uh, information there. So given that this has been in the news, given this is a threat, we are taking many actions to make sure or try to minimize any risks that the city of Nashville faces. But as Mr. Canignone Reminds me, when we discuss this, there are never any guarantees. You just don't know what's going to happen. All you can do is uh, act diligently to reduce any, any risks. There are constant malware uh, attacks going on. Much of it is diverted. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, as I understand it, a day doesn't go by where there's not someone trying to do something with a system like ours. So. Uh, if you did want to hear more about this uh, as a board or in one of the committees, of course, we could set this up. Uh, but I know it's an, it, it might be an issue of concern, so I wanted to at least reassure you that many steps are being taken to combat the risk. Finally, uh, we've had a couple of ward meetings, Ward 7 and Ward 3. Well, these we've been holding, I've been holding these for four years now in every ward, a great opportunity for us to hear from constituents and vice versa. We often do presentations regarding things that are going on with the city. I want to thank all of the aldermen who've attended so far. I think it is very helpful to have members of the board attend. And I think at Ward 3, we had uh, Alderman, Alderwoman Wilshire, Alderwoman Clee, Alderman Dowd, and at 7, we had, of course, Alderwoman Karen, and I believe Alderwoman Wilshire and maybe somebody else. Um, I forget exactly who attended, but the, uh, that's a great help. I've always encouraged the aldermen to come. We've also had some of our state reps come, and that's helpful too because we are all working as a team, aldermen, state reps, sometimes the state senators attend, sometimes even uh, our executive counselor, Deborah Pignatelli, to work as a team to advance Nashua's interests and to make progress for our community. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you, I, you're, there's an open invitation to anybody on the Board of Aldermen who wants to attend any of these ward meetings, the next one being in Ward 2 on Tuesday, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to attend and, uh, when you're available and uh, uh, learn from our citizens. In any event, that's all I have, Madam Chair, Madam President, and uh, unless there are any questions. Thank you. I'm going to just note for the record that Alderman Laws and Alderman Clemens have joined us during the mayor's comments. Do I have response to remarks of the mayor? Alderman Lopez. I 
I'd definitely be interested in attending um, a presentation by IT over the security um, methods that we use. I'm kind of curious, since we have like at least half a dozen different databases, some of which are obsolete, some of which are not, some of which talk to each other, exactly whether that makes it more secure because phishing can't figure out which, which one to get into, <laughs> or whether it, there's a need to invest in upgrades and more uh, collaboration. So I would definitely like to hear about that. Edmund Clee. I guess I'm going to do a Me Too moment, but yes, I would like to to also do that. And as far as um, our city doing phishing, um, I'll be honest with you, I received an email that was, um, I thought it was from the historic, the historic committee that I'm on, and it said to open up the, um, uh, it was the blueprints of something on Concord Street. It looked legitimate. I looked at it. It said Nashua NH.gov opened it up and it was one of those that caught. So I would love to be able to ask um, Mr. Catalone and so on, when can we and when can't we? I've done all the things of checking it and, and I went through the little extra training. So it, it does become very difficult to know if you don't know who this person is sending it. So I would love to have some kind of a meeting like that. I think there was one situation where they sent fishing expedition of emails that look like they came from me, and I'm like asking them to do X, Y, or Z, you know, uh, which obviously I never sent. I have one spam filter anyway. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so yes, they can look very legitimate. When you click on them, they may have logos and the like. It looks absolutely real, so you really need to be careful about what you click on and what you res what you click on, especially, and what you respond to. Alderman Laws. Uh, just because it, it's rele irrelevant right now, I am currently being fished by a fake Paul Shea account. So if anybody's getting messages, <laughs> uh, I, I, I message, you know, I've confirmed it is fake, okay, but they're talking about community grants, and so they, they know what they're doing. But it's on, it's on Facebook as well, so. Anyone else? Alderman Melissa Yes, Kalia. thank you. Um, Mayor John, just several of us were talking about this recent incident in Baltimore. It's pretty scary um, to see what can happen. Um, Mr. Cadignan came to PEDC with Ms. Kleiner and spoke um, not in depth, but did talk about um, the precautions that our IT department's taking and also the need to update programs and systems that we're using. So um, thank you for, for mentioning it because it's certainly something we all need to be aware of. And in Baltimore, they said it was like having a truck just come and take all their paper records and empty all their records, which is pretty scary. Anyone else on this side? Alderman Lopez. But, um, and I guess Attorney Bolton can answer this. Could this be like a presentation that is non-public? Because I don't know if streaming our security protocols on YouTube is going to help the situation. <laughs> we'll have a discussion. <laughs> some of it is uh, probably appropriate for non-public. Most of it probably, if public, is fine. Thanks. Anything further responses? Alderman Gathright. I'd just like to say they have a lot of training online because... I've been a victim of some of this and <laughs> and had to actually go through the training. And one of the training was actually 45 minutes. Yeah. And it was strictly about ransomware and malicious. And um, most of it was about that. So. Okay. Recognition period. There is none. Reading minutes of previous meetings and public hearings. There being no objection, I'll declare the minutes of the Board of Aldermen meetings of May 14th, May 16th, and May 20th, 2019, be accepted, <coughs> placed on file, and the reading suspended. Communications requiring only procedural actions and written reports from liaisons. There is none. Period for public comment relative to items to be expected, expected to be acted upon this evening. We have one speaker signed up, Fred Teboom. You give your name and address for the record, please. Uh, thank you, my name is uh, Fred Teboom. Uh, reside at 24 Cheyenne Drive. I'm here to talk about R19-126 on your agenda for final action, which is CDBG funding. Now, I became involved uh, in CDBG funding when I got contacted by Lynn Berry, who was now 87 years old. She was 86 at the time, because she had a, sim a simple 
hot water line leak in a mobile home that would have taken maybe uh, a $20 shark bite to fix, or maybe a, a, like a $100, $200 repair bill, and she wound up with an $1,100 mortgage on a single sole possession for mobile home. And like I said, 86 years old, she used to have her own business. She was many years a taxpayer, and here she wound up with a mortgage because she wanted some help for emergency repairs. So that prompted me to take a closer look at CDBG funding. In all the years involved in all the manic business, I've never been really concerned about CDBG funding, but this business with Lynn Berry prompted me to get involved. And so my first question is, how many of you have read the February 7th communications that's mentioned in the second paragraph of R19-126, which gives the background on the funding. Has anybody really looked at that? I don't think so. I'm not sure anybody in the committee, whom the first committee did, either, because I asked that question before. Well, I looked at all of that data. It's not all that much, but it is background on the funding. And I'd written a letter to the Board of Aldermen dated 23 April about that, about my concerns about CDBG funding. And I had also compiled, it took me about a day to do it, compiled a spreadsheet, a detailed spreadsheet of the funding profile. How much was funded, how much was requested, how much was awarded, what the award was for, how many people it served, what the budget is, and what the compensation is, to the extent it could be determined from these submittals in the February 7th data. Now, the first thing that struck me was that the city administration takes 32% of the funding, right off the top, 32%. Now, they, they're supposed to, the city is not supposed to collect more than 20%. That's by HUD regulation. I've been in touch with HUD, a regional office, <coughs> at levels well above the level where the city HUD program manager deals with. And I'm going to ask them to investigate this. <coughs> but the city did. They broke their cut, as I call it, administrative cut, into two parts. And... Um, one part is 135,000, the other one 115,000. By far the large, by far the largest amount for the CDBG funding, 32%. I don't think that's appropriate. I'm going to ask for a review on that. No one ever questioned that, and for my review of the minutes in the committee, nobody in the committee questioned that. <coughs> and some some of you in that committee, most of you in the committee are here. Now, the next thing that struck me, and I'm going to go through all of them, because that's not my purpose here, is an item as number two on the, in the resolution. The resolution has the sequential numbering of the funding, one through 11, if you look at it. Number two, entrepreneurship for all. Now, they are being awarded $40,000 for support of microenterprises. Seems okay. It's a new application, but their executive director earns $185,000 a year in annual compensation. I presume that's benefits and salary, but $185,000. And a program manager, who's I guess the next person underneath the, <laughs> the executive director, he makes $145,000 a year. I know that because the applications ask for the chief managers to provide the compensation. Of all those applied, only entrepreneurship for all supplied this information, even those required in the applications. No one in the committee asked us a question. So I question you know, with that kind of compensation provided to the managers of these nonprofits, do they really need CDBG money? 
I'll take another example. Nasha Children's Home. I picked on that in the committee. They asked for, and were awarded $39,000 for window replacement. And they asked for uh, $45,600. Now, Nasha Children's Home has a $5.1 million budget. They have $4 million in combined compensation, in compensation, combined salary and benefits. They serve, they serve 85 children and employ 70 staff. This brings an average compensation, salary and benefits, of $57,000 per employee. That's a lot of money. It costs, if you take the $5.1 million of the budget, divide it into the, seven, in the 85 children they serve, that's $60,000 per child. Is anybody auditing these things? Is anybody questioning these things? Executive Director David Villati did not provide this compensation. So I researched a bit further. Since it's a nonprofit, they have to declare their um, annual accounting to the charitable trust unit of the Secretary of State. Uh, of the Attorney General, just like I do for the Holocaust Memorial. And lo and behold, 2017, last year of his reporting, our Director Civiletti, David Civiletti, guess what? He was making $139,000 in 2017. Didn't report it this year. He reported to the Charitable Trust because he had to. Who has checked on their real need for funding? Why do they need our CDBG money? Board of Aldermen's President Lori Wilson works as a business manager for the National Children's Home. And but she, this being president of this board, continues to serve as the chairperson of the Human Affairs Committee and participates in all debate. The only thing she doesn't do is to take the final vote. I think that that's possibly a conflict of interest, possibly an ethics violation. And I've asked Lori Wilson that when she became president that she stepped down as chairman of the Human Affairs Committee. I think it is a conflict of interest. Now take a look at item number 11, which is the main reason I'm here, the Housing Improvement Program. That talks about loans for emergency repairs for low-income owners of homes and mobile homes. All other grantees offer grants. Not a single one is offered to, has to make a loan. But low-income owners have to make loans. Why? That's how Lynn Barry, who's in bad, not great financial situation, wound up with an $1,100 mortgage. But organizations for the chief executive officers make $185,000, $145,000, or $137,000, no loans, all grants. That's not right. That is where Lynn Berry, looking for some help from the city, wound up with a mortgage of $1,100. So this housing improvement program that today allows only loans. Now, because I've been making a lot of noise about that, we had a meeting with Mayor Dantes about it, there been discussions about it, during the Human Affairs Committee in April, Alderman Melissa Golger made an amendment. And it read, emergency work, emergency work 
costing up to $5,000 may be offered in a form of a grant rather than a loan to owners at or below 50% of the area medium income, AMI. 50% AMI is not a large income. 50% AMI on the HUD guidelines is considered very low income. If you don't believe that, a tabular summary, you can Google it, and it provides the information. If you look for Nashua, it tells you what the limits are, and defines 50% as very low income. I thought it was for amendments and acceptable amendments. The meeting following that, the meeting immediately before this final version came before you, there was a change made. And the change that was made is the grant between, and I'm quoting directly, and you can see this in your uh, 19126 on the bottom of the paragraph on item number 11 that says, grants between $1,000 and $5,000 for emergency repairs to owners at or below 30% AMI. So they changed the 50% to 30%. So only the very low, extremely low income people that need emergency repairs, if those repairs are over $1,000, less than $5,000, can get a grant. If you're over 30%, you get a loan. If you're over 80%, you can get a, then you don't get a loan or a grant. I think that's wrong. I think the change was wrong. It was argued by Lori Wilshire, Alvin Lopez, uh, Alvin Karen. I think it was wrong. There was a lot of discussion about What's an emergency repair versus deferred maintenance? But you know, funny thing, none of that was asked to people that got $40,000, $50,000, $30,000 grants. They didn't say, hey, you want to replace some windows? Was that an emergency repair or was that deferred maintenance? That's none of that. They only asked a question about the extremely low income owners. It's wrong. It is just not right. It is wrong on two accounts. The language before you and item number 11 is wrong on two accounts. First, it only provides loans to those making over 30% AMI. Up to 80%. Well, it doesn't define where, how high it goes, but I presume it's up to 80%. And the other thing that's wrong, it puts a low limit of $1,000, and that means automatically any bidder for these repair jobs, they all have to be bid out. Every single one bid is going to come in at over $1,000, no matter how small the loan, the repair job. Just like it happened to Lynn Berry, $200 job with a plumber. I could have done it with a $20, $20 shark bite. I could have come in with an owner and done it myself. I've done it at my home. $1,000. Some of the bids came in $2,000. There were, I think, three bids. $2,400, about $1,800, and the low bidder was $1,100 for a job that could have been done with a $20 shark bite because it's $1,000 minimum. Wrong. So let me conclude to say that I like and ask Alma Melissa Golger go back to her original amendment, which I think was a good one, and I'll re read it again, the final point. Emergency work costing up to $5,000 may be offered in the form of a grant rather than a loan to owners at or below 50% area medium income, meaning very low income. Owners earning above 50% AMI may be offered assistance in the form of a, of a loan. I think that language is perfectly acceptable. It was there. I don't know why they got rid of it. I ask that you fix it. Thank you.
Communications requiring final approval. Communication from Mayor Jim Donsitz relative to contract for biodiesel fuel. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to make a motion to accept, place on file, and award a contract to Dennis K. Burke for an estimated amount of $25,000. You've heard the motion. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Communication from Patricia D. Pietzo, City Clerk, <coughs> relative to NRO Section 5-6, Compensation. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to make a motion to accept, place on file, and pursuant to NRO 5-6, authorize the City to pay Alderman Gidge his full stipend for the second quarter of 2019. You've heard the, uh, the motion. Is there discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Petitions. In accordance with the NRO, the following petitions for address changes are an address change petition for C sheet 67, lot 477 Amherst Street, Nashua, and an address change petition for sh sheet 87, lot 18, 13 Second Street, Nashua. There being no objection, I'll accept the petitions as read, refer them to the Committee on Infrastructure, and schedule a public hearing for Monday, June 17th. 2019 at 7 p.m. in the Aldermanic Chamber. Nominations, appointments, and elections. There are none. Reports of committees. There being no objection, I'll declare the report of the May 8, 2019 Budget Review Committee accepted and placed on file. There being no objection, I'll declare the report of the May 15th Finance Committee accepted and placed on file. There being no objection, I will declare the report of the May 13th Human Affairs Committee accepted and placed on file. There being no objection, I will declare the report of the May 22nd, 2019 Committee on Infrastructure accepted on place on file. And there being no objection, I will declare the report of the May 21st, 2019 Planning and Economic Development Committee accepted in place on file. Confirmation of Mayor's appointments? There are none. Unfinished business resolutions. Second reading of Resolution 19-126, authorizing the Mayor to apply for and expend the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and Home Investment Partnership Program funds for the fiscal year 2020. Thank you. Just to uh, let the Board know, I will not be voting on Resolution 19-126 <coughs> as my employer has applied for funding. Alderman Karen. Yes, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to amend R-19-126 in its entirety by replacing it with the proposed amendments made by the Human Affairs Committee. You've heard the motion. Is there discussion on that motion? Alderman Lopez. Just with regards to the 50% versus 30% question, um, I, it was my recollection that that was decision decision was made so that we didn't use up the entire fund on just a small group of people. And so there would be more available for lower income people. Was that accurate? I'm asking Marianne Melisa Goya. All the women, Melisa Goya? Yes. Um, at the um, second to the last meeting, which Mr. T. Boom referenced, where I um, made the motion to use the 50% of AMI. Ms. Skeena was with us, and she had sent us a communication indicating that that was her recommendation. At our last meeting, with further discussion, it was the feeling of the committee that because this was a new program and we weren't sure what was going to happen with our resources, um, we would try it this year at 30% AMI, so we would hopefully have enough money. And then depending upon um, the request for funding, we would look at it in next year's um, CDBG grant and looking at increasing that or lowering it as it is to 50%. Um, is That's my recollection. And I see Alderman Karen and, and Alderman Will share nodding in agreement. So um, the original motion had been for 50%, but then, um, if, like I said, after further conversation, because it's something new that we're doing, it was determined that we should start at 30% and then, um, based on the response, look at 50% for next year. Thank you. You're welcome. Motion before us is to amend R19-126 by replacing it with the proposed amendments made by, made 
by the Human Affairs <laughs> Committee. Further discussion? Alderman Clemens? To, to the last point, why why is the minimum a thousand? Why isn't it zero? All the, um, the the guidance we've always received, um, Alderman Clemens, and, and I'm saying always that we've received for a number of years from Ms. Skena is that um, again, as Mr. Tebum referenced, anything below that we really look at. <laughs> being deferred maintenance or maintenance and um, and there's probably very few things that would come in under a thousand to begin with so that was the cutoff that has been used historically for that Alderman Clemens I, I would I respect that but I, I don't think that there's any harm then if that's the case in amending this to to be zero and up or just basically to say up to five thousand uh, dollars so I'm going to make that amendment uh, that's my motion is to amend that wording to eliminate uh, the words one thousand and up to so therefore it would read costing up to or I'm sorry I'm going to eliminate the thousand dollars so basically says Emergency work costing up to five thousand dollars. Alderman Lopez. I would just want to point out that there's a number of cash assistance programs that are operated in other areas too that do the same thing and they typically reach five hundred. So if the city gets into the business of processing every single claim, then basically someone's applying for CDBG money for much smaller and more difficult to reach um, repairs or emergencies or that kind of stuff whereas other groups can do it better and then additionally then we're subject to HUD guidelines as to whether we accept that or not and it could further erode the resources for somebody who doesn't have anywhere else to go the motion is to amend to um, eliminate the 1,000 and have it be up to five thousand dollars that's the motion by Alderman Clemens further discussion on that motion Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. One abstention. That motion fails. So the motion before us is to replace R19-126 with the proposed amendments by Human Affairs. Alderman Jetty. Could, could I ask, is, the, uh, is, what, is this discussion we've just had about the, the 1,000 or the 5,000, is that the only change? Is that the only amendment to this? Um, all, all the women will easily go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, the, if you look um, at what's before you, the amended resolution, the um, amounts that are being awarded to each agency has been amended. So um, we received the initial um, proposals from each agency. And then based on the funds we had available to us, both in um, new funds we received this year as well as um, funds that were not used, so we, we got to roll them over into this year, um, we then made um, recommendations. So some people got nothing. Some people um, got a percentage of what they asked for. I don't think anyone from memory got everything that they asked for. Um, so, and I can share this with you in terms of what the initial request was and the allocated amounts. That's the most recent. But the numbers that are reflected in um, the amendment are what the committee awarded. Further question, so, Alderman Jetty? Yeah. So, so just looking at this, um, it looks like we got less than than what we thought we were getting. Yes. So you made adjustments to reflect the, uh, the 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 fact that the grant is um, is less than you ex expected. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And if I may, that I think we have only had one year where we had fewer requests than we had money, and um, and. 
and part of this also is that we try to put some money aside for contingency in case any of these projects run over. So um, money's also allocated there to cover any costs that were unforeseen. But typically, we have more requests than we have um, resources. Further discussion? The motion is to amend. All those in favor say aye. 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 I abstain. Uh, opposed? Okay, motion, Alderman Karen. Yes, I'd like to make a motion for final passage of R-19-126 as amended. Motion is for final passage of Resolution 19-126 as amended. Further discussion on that motion? Alderman Tenza. You know, if I could address one thing that um, Mr. Teeboom said earlier, too, just about the, the city placing a mortgage on this property, just to clarify, because... Um, you know, essentially what the city is doing is putting a lien, not not a mortgage. The city is not going to go after these folks if, if they, they owe us money. But when the property is sold, uh, the city will seek to recoup uh, whatever we've paid out. So um, I don't want people out there thinking that potentially the city is going to be going after these low-income senior citizens. Um, that's clearly not the intent and not how, not how the program works. Thank you. Alderman Karen. Yes. And I'd like to add to that, um, because that is a loan, uh, and we look to get that money back, that money goes back into the pot so that we can give it out again because we never know from year to year uh, the needs of the community. So we feel that it's important that we try to recoup as much as we can, and that's why we always have a little bit in the pot when we start the year off. So I thank you, Alderman Tensa. Further discussion? Seeing none. Motion before us is for final passage of Resolution 19-126 as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And I abstain. Thank you. Second reading of Resolution 19-134, Adoption of Strategic Planning Goals. Alderwoman Melissa Goya. Yes, um, I would move for final passage of R-19-134. Motion is for final passage of Resolution 19-134. Discussion on that motion? <laughs> All the women, Melissa Goya. Yes, thank you. If I may make a comment. Um, these, as I indicated at PEDC, this is the first time um, we've had a work product from this committee. These goals are looked at every two years. Um, I have to thank the members of the committee because um, this process went on for a while and um, it was extended by um, an election, so some of the committee members changed, which meant people had to kind of get a perspective of where we were in the process. And as you look through the goals, I would just comment that the purpose was really to make them broad enough that each division department would be able to look at those and come up with their own broader or more specific, rather, um, objectives to address those. But just to give some overarching Goals that um, would dovetail with the mayor's goals for the budget as well as um, master planning and moving forward for the city. And I would like to thank um, Director Marchant and Director Cummings for their support of this process. Okay. Motion before us is for final passage, passage of Resolution 19-134. Further discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Second reading of Resolution 19-137, authorizing the sale of tax-deeded property located at 342 Main Street. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. President, I would like to make a motion of final passage of R-19-137. Motion is for final passage of Resolution 19-137. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Second reading of Resolution 19-138, relative to the appropriation of an additional U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Home Investment Partnership Program funds to NeighborWorks of Southern New Hampshire. Alderwoman Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would like to move for final passage of R-19-138. Motion before us is for final passage of Resolution 19-138. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. <coughs> Second reading of Resolution 19-140, authorizing the City of Nashua to enter into a lease agreement with Nashua Police Athletic League. 
Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to make a motion for final passage of R19140. Motion is for final passage of Resolution 19140. Is there discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Unfinished business ordinances. Second reading of Ordinance 19-042, designating the Southwest Conservation Area as City Conservation Land. Alderman Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I move for final passage of 019-042, and if I could speak on it quickly. You may. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone who supported it through the committee. I know that the Conservation Committee has been working on this for a long time. It's been a labor of love and something that I know Brian was involved in. So everything from stewardship to finally naming it. So I'm, I'm excited to see this happen. Nice. Thank you for that. That's nice. The motion is for final passage of Ordinance 19042. Further discussion? Alderman Jetty. I would just like to, uh, to endorse this. So this is mostly, if not all, in Ward 5. And it basically uh, uh, takes land that the city has acquired largely through donations uh, and put and puts it under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission and the Conservation Commission and enables the Conservation Commission to adopt the stewardship plans that that uh, all the woman uh, Kelly referred to and so this is uh, uh, kind of a housekeeping thing it, but it puts it under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission so that they can uh, regulate it and, and uh, conserve the land as was intended. Further discussion? Okay, the motion is for final passage of Ordinance 19042. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. New business resolutions. First reading of Resolution 19-142, authorizing the Mayor and City Treasurer to issue bonds not to exceed the amount of $6,200,000 for various improvements to the Jackson Mills and Mine Falls hydroelectric facilities. Alderman Dowd. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to accept the first reading of R19-142 by roll call, assign it to the Budget Review Committee, and that a public hearing be scheduled for Monday, June 24th, 2019, at 7 p.m. in the automatic chamber. Okay, I didn't ask for additional sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Schmidt, Alderman Tenza, Alderman Melissa Golia, Alderman Kelly, Alderman Lopez, Alderman Clee, Alderman Dowd, Alderman Gathright, Alderman O'Brien. Um, okay, so we need a roll call. Would the clerk please call the roll? Alderman O'Brien. Yay. Alderman Harriet Gathright. Yay. Alderman Dowd. Yes. Alderman Clee. Yay. Alderman Laws. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Karen. Yes. Alderman Alderwoman Kelly. Yes. Alderman Jetty. Yes. Alderwoman Melisi Gola. Yes. Alderman Tenza. Yes. Alderman Schmidt. Yes. Alderman Clemens. Yes. Alderman Wilshire. Yes. We have 14 yeas. Motion carries. First reading of Resolution 19-143 relative to the acceptance and appropriation of $868,207.46 from the State of New Hampshire Department of Transportation, Transportation Alternative Program Funds into Community Development Grant Activity, Sidewalk Upgrades, and Bicycle Lanes. Additional sponsors? Alderman Schmidt, Alderman Tenza, Alderman Melissa Goya, Alderman Kelly, Alderman Karen, Alderman Lopez, Alderman Laws, Alderman... Clee, Alderman Dowd, Alderman Gathright, Alderman O'Brien. Given its first reading, I will assign that to the Human Affairs Committee. First reading, Resolution 19-144, relative to the acceptance and appropriation of $60,000 from New Hampshire Charitable Foundation into Parks and Recreation Grant Activity, Jeff Moore and Fun, Shade Canopies at Roby Park. Additional sponsors, Alderman Schmidt. Alderman Tenza, Alderman Melise Gullia, Alderman Kelly, Alderman Karen, Alderman Laws, Alderman Clee, Alderman Dowd, Alderman Gathright, and Alderman O'Brien. Given its first reading, I will send it to the Budget Review Committee and the Board of Public Works. First reading, Resolution 19-145, authorizing the City of Nashville to enter into agreement for emergency ambulance services with American Medical Response. Additional sponsors, Alderman Schmidt. 
Alderman Dowd, Alderman Gathright, Alderman Lopez, and then Alderman O'Brien. A few minutes first reading, it'll be assigned to the Finance Committee. First reading of Resolution 19-146, authorizing the granting of easements to Penichuk Water Works, Inc. for the construction, utilization, and maintenance of water lines. Additional sponsors, Alderman O'Brien, Alderman Gathright, Alderman Lopez, Alderman Melissa Goya. Given its first reading, this will be assigned to the Committee on Infrastructure and the Nashua City Planning Board. New business ordinances. First reading of ordinance 19-046, amending the zoning map by rezoning 610 Amber Street from Park Industrial PI to General Business GB. Additional sponsors? Alderman Schmidt, Alderman Gathright, Alderman O'Brien. There being no objection, I'll accept the first reading of Ordinance 19046, assign it to the Planning and Economic Development Committee and the National City Planning Board and schedule a public hearing for Tuesday, July 16th, 2019 at 7 p.m. in the Aldermanic Chamber. Period for public comment. We have one person signed up, Lori Ortolano. Lori Ortolano, 41 Berkeley Street. Um, I wanted to address um, some of the comments raised at the ward meetings, at the town meetings um, last week. And the big issue that stuck on my mind was the mayor spoke with some passion about the um, demoralizing nature of the investigative report that was done. Um, he had heard from departments uh, outside of assessing and um, received a number of comments from I think probably management that said it was very demoralizing and it was a real morale killer to the offices and I have a pretty different view of that and what is demoralizing really when you have a situation like what has happened in the assessing office and I'll relate it to my very early career when I became an engineer 35 years ago mm -hmm. in a field that was pretty much male dominated. And I got a job in a company down south and I was very motivated. I had graduated from WPI, had done really well in my field and enjoyed it. And um, I got assigned to a job with a project <coughs> engineer that was five years older than me. Busy job, uh, big deadlines and required some overtime. And very early on, it was very apparent that the older engineer was not a worker. He was a 20-hour-a-week 20, 20 guy. And um, I was pretty motivated to do my job. And um, he had a girlfriend in another state, so Friday at lunch he split and took on a road trip to the other state and rolled in Monday after lunch when he left from that place and came back to work. And every week I would have to listen to the details of what was happening in the shower between him and his girlfriend before he left and when he came back. And then had to, you know, um, carry the load. Thursday was 18 holes of golf in the afternoon. And Tuesday and Wednesday were workouts at the gym. And I put up with it for about eight months and then I was all set and I went into management and said, I'm all set with this, here's what's going on. And, um, you know, that was a very demoralizing situation for me in my career uh, because I worked and I had to deal with somebody who didn't work. Um, the gentleman left after a couple months, uh, moved closer to his girlfriend, which was a good thing. Fast forward five years and I moved my career into a new area in a new department um, that had never had a woman in the department. And I get put on a very busy classified project that was over budget and behind schedule. And management made it very clear that there was no money for overtime and um, we all had to work overtime. I again get assigned to with an engineer who's probably seven years, eight years older than me and again wasn't an overly motivated person. Um, certainly not as bad as the first one that was half time work was pretty bad but could easily shave off 10 hours a week and never came in on a Saturday. And partway into the project, the project manager, an uh, older gentleman ready to retire, wanted me to learn project management and said, I'm going to start sending you the budgets. I want you to look at the budgets and get familiar with them so you can step into project management someday. 
when I got my first budget and I looked at it, the engineer I was working with was being paid 60 hours of overtime a month. I was shocked. I was told there was no overtime. I was working overtime. I never saw my constituents come in once on a Saturday, and he was getting paid on a military contract. I was floored. Marched into the manager's office and said, what's this? You know, how's, how is this happening? And the answer I got was, his wife was having a baby and he was under a lot of stress, and he was trying to help him out by giving him a little extra pay. <clears throat> Needless to say, you know my personality now. <laughs> it really wasn't different back then, and it didn't fly with me at all. I went two layers up, and I shut down that overtime. And that was very demoralizing for me. Um, that's what a demoralizing work circumstance sounds like to me and feels like to me. And when I look in the assessing office and I look at the front end of the office with the four clerical staff women you have there, they work endlessly. Um, and they are tied to their computer screens pretty much all day. And I think if you look at any one of their desks, you're going to see just piles of paper around them. They're just wrapped in paper. And they have very set breaks. I've never seen an abuse of any break time with them. And I think it's pretty demoralizing when you have a senior assessor who leaves like this senior assessor does and tells everyone I'm heading out to the field and signs out on the board, I'm going to go check properties. And then you find out he's in the park for two and a half hours. Or let me include that, driving and in the park or in, in the Holiday Inn lot for two two and a half or three hours at a time. Ms. Hortolano, this board does not have anything to do with personnel matters, so I would respectfully ask that you keep your comments to what the board has purview of. We don't have purview of personnel matters. Well, that's okay because you, what you do have purview of is performance issues. How do we address performance? And that, to me, is reasonable. Um, and I'm addressing something that was addressed by the mayor at both ward meetings, the, de the demoralizing nature of this report. I'm going to submit to you tonight, for the record, which you all received emails, the four reports that I gave you. And I'd like them to go in the minutes. And they'd be available to the public to see and read for themselves. I'm also concerned by the minimizing, I think, of the issue. Um, by the mayor. And what I mean by that is I listened to the comments at the Ward um, 7 meeting where he mentioned that the investigation was only two weeks, that there were only two data points above an hour that he was out. And I don't know the content of what he was referring to, but it was a month-long investigation. Um, and. You know, I don't want to debate what it was. I want the report to speak to itself. And all I've done with this report is give 50 copies out to business leaders and members of the community and share it through email without a cover letter. There's nothing to discuss on it. You read it for what it is, and that's it. You know, let it stand on its own. Um, you know, regarding your issue, Ms. Wilshire, on personnel, I received an email from Ben Clemens that was very pointed that what I provided was very incomplete for the accusations I made. And please get the um, expense reports. Please get the logs. Please bring forward the data. Show us that what you're talking about is real. Okay? Um, I don't know what, I didn't know what to make of that. I mean, is that something I'm supposed to prove? Um, because that's what I brought tonight. I brought the data that Ben Clemens said, show us, substantiate what you're doing. And I think if an alderman is telling me I need to substantiate, I came here <coughs> to substantiate. So I'm not certain if you're telling me I can't, I shouldn't, or I'm out of line. What I'm telling you, Ms. Ortolano, is this board does not deal with personnel matters for city employees. Well, I'm not asking you to deal with it, and I'm not asking you to reprimand, but I am asking you to listen. Um, We've been listening week after week, and we just keep hearing the same thing from you about this employee. Well, we don't deal with employee issues in this city. We I are not the employer board. I, 
I don't think you've dealt with this week after week with me. The report came out two weeks ago. Um, really, um, I really didn't say much about this particular employee. Um, and I addressed any concerns I had with your administration and Ms. Kleiner. I didn't come here specifically. The only time I addressed this individual was on the anti-nepotism policy, right? I challenge you to find the minutes where I've been in here talking endlessly about this individual. I, I don't believe I have. So, um, and Ben, you raised the issue regarding expense reports. And the interesting issue on expense reports is back um, in October, I went to finance and I pulled expense reports for from 2014 up on assessors. And um, this assessor became a commercial assessor three years ago. So he took on a different role. So the assessor he replaced, commercial assessor, I pulled his um, expense reports and looked at his travel mileage, which commercial assessors typically travel very low mileage relative to residential because permits and properties. Can I, I have a ruling from the Corporation Council as to whether this is something the board has purview of? Or should it go to the HR department in the city hall? This is general public comment. You've opened it up to speak on any topic. Three minutes. You know, I shared all this information today. I had an hour long meeting with the union leader, an hour long meeting with the Telegraph. Um, they were both interested in writing reports and, and, and issuing a story on these issues. So I'm sharing it with you because I shared it externally as well, and because I was asked by an alderman about this. And I, I do think it's relevant, and you'd want to hear. Um, I want you to know I, I did do my homework. Um, I went and gathered these reports that were commercial assessors. And when I looked at the commercial assessor who left, the mileage traveled is very low, 20, 40, 50 miles um, a month. When I look at the other commercial assessor who's in our assessing department, his mileage is very low, 80, 20, 40, 30, low mileage. The residential assessors have much higher mileage going to individual properties, um, 175, 150. Um, the month of April, our residential assessors covered 226 miles because April was a busy month to gather data. So that's, that's fine. When I look at this individual who moved into commercial assessing, his mileage is higher than anyone's, 220, 200, 210, 180. That's very unusual. And when I saw that in October, it was a red flag for me. I went and called John Griffin and I said, I think you've got a fraud problem over here. There's an issue, okay? It's hard to prove, okay, other than giving it to him. And I got the response, I'll get back to you in a week. I never heard back from him again. But then I, as I started putting, I, I pushed that aside because I said, that's too big an issue. It's too hard for me. And then I started looking at the property cards more. And I started seeing property cards that were so off. For example, property cards that had visits to homes right, written in the activity section that were not visited. So those were potentially mileage charged by properties that were not visited. And they could be easily sat down in a round table with anyone who'd want to see them to know, to see how I know that and how I'm able to ascertain that. But I am. And um, there is a method. So, so that mileage was very concerning. And um, it's very interesting to me that in April, when Kim Kleiner asked for the field logs to be attached, the residential assessors attach a field log they go out to 78 homes. They attach 226 miles. The commercial assessor now, who's been charging last month 220 miles, suddenly charges 45, 43, way down. And guess how many properties they visited in April? <coughs> the, the very month that we are the busiest we could possibly be in assessing, because we have so many permits to catch, A9s, exemptions, all this property work, they went to seven. Seven. That's startling. So the expense and the mileage logs from March would tell me that this individual had to be out at 100, 150 homes. 
but the, but the data, the records don't support it. And, and I want you to understand that. That's the big red flag for me. How do you go from 200, 220, 280 down to 43? And a busy, busy month. The second thing is we could look at that and say, you know what, there's a lot of work going on in assessing. This assessor didn't go to properties. What's the big thing happening in assessing? Abatements. Abatements are huge right now. Everyone got those abatements divvied up. Each assessor got about 90 files they had to work on. When you look at your junior assessor, um, your junior assessor in assessing, who is not certified yet, I don't believe, who's in training, since January, he's done about 225 pages of abatements. And they are complete abatements. These are heavy duty sales intensive abatements where he had to do comps, go out to the homes, take measurements. So there's a lot of work here. And I'm gonna venture to guess that this assessor is gonna get through 70, 75 abatements, challenging ones. When I look at our senior assessor, who is a supervisory level, look at the packet. 25 pages. And what are these abatements? Most of them, well, there were 14, actually, there are eight abatements, and six of them are fire, prorations, or dilapidated mobile homes that had to be reevaluated. Ms. Ortolano, there's one minute left to our public okay. comment period, so if you could start wrapping it up, I'd appreciate sure. it. Thank so you. So there's a big issue and a disparity <laughs> between why is a senior official, a senior supervisor, unable to really put a bite into the abatements and take on the ones that are challenging and get any work done? There are actually no abatements here that required any work at all. Six of the abatements in here are people who filed after the March 1st deadline. So we had to tear the front sheet off, stamp a D on it, and put it in the file. And you get credit for work done. That is three minutes of work. Six of them out of the eight. That leaves two in five months. That's pretty startling. So it's not abatements he's doing. It's not traveling to, part, uh, to properties he's doing. And it's not MLS adjusting, because I checked that too. This is where the concern comes in. And as far as morality and demoralizing, I know what that's about. And it's demoralizing when you're a hard worker and you're doing your job and you see somebody who gets breaks like this who doesn't appear to be. Thank you. Thank you. Remarks by members of the board. I'll start on this side. No one? Alderman Lopez. On June 15th, the Tree Street's block party. Um, it's at two, from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. Um, on Ash Street, and we're featuring Mighty Mystic, a reggae band this year, so everybody's welcome to attend. Alderman Kelly. Uh, thank you. A little bit later in the month, <clears throat> June 29th, June, would you take at 2 p.m., um, we will be having our second annual Pride Parade uh, and festival. It's longer this year. We're expecting a great turnout. Um, we're still looking for sponsors, volunteers, and the t-shirts just went on sale. Um, so you guys can go on and get all of your memorabilia before um, the big day. So nashvillepride.org has all the information. Alderman Jetty. So um, I know that um, I know that a lot of, a lot of uh, us, um, you know, are. Um, uh, don't don't like hearing what Miss Miss Mrs. Orlano is uh, is reporting to us uh, because it's disturbing, and um, you know I don't know. I mean, for, at this point, these are all allegations. I acknowledge, and that um, the employees involved are entitled to their due process, but I would encourage us to, uh, you know. You know, to listen to these uh, to these allegations, and hopefully, the the information she's provided will be turned over to the the attorney that we've hired to investigate this, and that uh, that an investigation will will occur. I don't, you know, I'm not um, you know schooled in the ways of uh, of labor law where unions are involved, um, so I, I know it's not. Um, 
uh, you know, I, I know there's a, there's a whole process that that is involved. I did take a look at the collective bargaining agreement that uh, that regulates this union, and I, I do see that that there is a provision in there that the city is entitled to uh, terminate an employee for good cause, and whether or not good cause exists here, I guess, is is what uh, the attorney we've hired will, will show us, but, um, you know, I, I think that uh, I've heard from other employees of the city who, uh, far from being demoralized by this investigation, are wel welcoming it. Uh, they you know, they resent, um, you know, if, if these allegations are true, they, they resent um, the, you know, what this, uh, uh, you know, if, I'm, I'm trying to be careful here, if this employee is, is, is guilty of what he's being accused of, and uh, it's st still an allegation, you know, they, they, they uh, are not comfortable, uh, you know, being looked at uh, by the rest of the city you know, there we, we, we've always heard uh, people malign our employees, and we have a lot of good employees, but when we, when we find uh, you know, a, a, a bad one, if we found a bad one, then we, then we ought to act appropriately. We ought to take the measures that, that we should to, to eliminate that uh, situation. Um, <coughs> so I, I just want to say, you know, I, I for one, um, you know, thank Mrs. Ortolano for all the time she spent, uh, you know, looking into this situation and, uh, and you know, has brought to light things that, that I had no knowledge of and I don't, I don't think any of us had knowledge of. And, um, you know, I think we, we owe her a, a debt of gratitude for bringing it up. I'm not saying that what she's brought up is, um, is, has been proven. Uh, but we, I think there's probable cause for us to look into it and investigate it uh, and, um, you know, and ask the mayor to, to do that. And uh, I think he is. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the result of the investigation by Attorney Broth. Um, <coughs> but I'm, you know, and, you know, public the second public comment period is not limited to what we're, what, uh, the, you know, the legislation that we have before us. It's the, I think it's the only opportunity that citizens have to address us. And uh, so I, I would hate to, um, to discourage people from coming forward uh, with, with legitimate complaints uh, that we, you know, maybe should be hearing. Thank you. Madam President, can I claim personal privilege? Um, Attorney Jetty, Jetty just inferred that the rest of us just don't like hearing it because it's uncomfortable. And I'd just like to clarify, I dislike it because I don't, I, I see this as an HR issue and I think that's where it needs to be. I don't want to try navigating the public comment field of what did I accidentally say about an employee who may or may not be innocent or may or may not be guilty. And I believe at least two weeks ago, the mayor told us that he is investigating it. I know that multiple claims have been brought up against the assessing department and that Ms. Ortleano has very thoroughly researched what their activities are. And every month there continues to be more and more issues. So I don't have a problem with her reporting them. I just think the public comment is for public comment, not lengthy exposition of information. If she feels like she doesn't have a voice and isn't able to send us information, then she should be working with her local alderman or she can be sending us information and we should be putting that in public records, certainly. I just think that this particular personnel issue should be brought up in public comment, introduced, but then let be investigated. There has not been time for any of that to be done. All the woman, Melissa Goya. Thank you. Um, I, I will just make one comment regarding um, the, uh, the last public comment. Um, I think it's been very clearly stated that we as a board don't investigate and we we don't get involved in HR but um, I do feel the mayor recognizes the importance of this and is moving forward with an attorney to investigate and um, I am looking forward to hearing the results of that investigation but I think that um, 
the responsibility for that investigation clearly is with the mayor's office and in his HR department and not with this board. Um, two, two things. Um, unfortunately, we had hoped all, um, Alderman Gidge would be with us this evening, and he's not. So um, I, I regret that. But a couple of weeks ago, the artwork studios at um, 14 Court Street had its ribbon cutting. And um, again, I would just like to acknowledge his work in bringing that forward and thank him and look forward to sitting across the horseshoe and thanking him personally. So hopefully he will be joining us soon. Also, um, this week, which is not, um, it looks like shaping up to be a very pleasant week weather-wise, is the last week our sculptures will be working. And um, I thought of them today as it was cold and rainy and, and miserable. Um, but they've been working very hard. If you haven't had a chance to go visit them, I would encourage you to go vi visit them at the Picker Artist Collaborative. And the closing is at 1 p.m. this Saturday, meeting here behind City Hall to then go tour the locations for the three sculptures. Um, they are each delightful and enjoy talking to people. Um, they break for lunch and break for dinner there at the location, um, but are, are busy working away. And some of you may have caught the YouTube video of um, Gerard from Kenya singing to some students who visited from Ledge Street, which was great. So I encourage you to go and visit them or at least attend on Saturday. Thank you. Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I just want to address a couple of uh, things. So first, um, I was mentioned in public comment, and all I will say is that I, I didn't want to address this last uh, time we were here, but I guess my hand has been forced. Uh, so, um, you know, when somebody makes an accusation against somebody, the details should be there in full. And what we originally got was not complete. And I'm not saying that what was in there wasn't accurate or that it wasn't uh, <coughs> true, but I don't know that. And there's no corroborating evidence. And so I appreciate the fact that um, Ms. Ortolano is bringing forward some more information so that maybe we can corroborate that uh, report that uh, she paid $8,000 of her own money for. But, um, you know, I'll look at it and I'll make my own judgment as I hope other people will. But, you know, I, I made the comments that I made to her because we didn't have a full report. We didn't have anything. All it was was accusations. Pictures of, I don't even know what, somebody in a car somewhere how do I know that the private investigator, uh, why, why should I trust him? I didn't pay $8,000 for it. What, what is his, what are his um, credentials? Why should I automatically take something at face value? Look, we're talking about a public employee here who has the right to due process and when there are personnel issues, they should come up in the appropriate venue. And that is to the HR director or to the mayor or to somebody in City Hall. And, you know, it would have been appropriate for that to come out that way. If you really feel like you want to spend $8,000 of your own money on something like that, why do you have to go to the press with it? it makes me wonder. Is this, a, is this a political thing? Is there an undercurrent here that we should know about? I don't know. But I do know this. I know that there is a man who works here for the city who has been publicly berated by a citizen, and it, it's really too bad. Because what that tells people who want to work, come and work for this city is you better watch out for, for citizens in Nashville because they let them go crazy on you. 
they let them go after you. And your reputation could be put on the line if somebody has enough money, they can get that out there and uh, they can ruin your career. So, you know, I, I, I don't like this stuff. I don't think that, it, that this is the appropriate venue for it. I think, it's, I think there's some kind of political undercurrent here, and I'm gonna state that for the record. I will look at what is presented to me, but I look forward to the private uh, investigator, or I'm sorry, to, the, to our city investigators report. And you know, the only thing that I, I will address is that the, basically what I've heard is that we have an employee that maybe at best doesn't do their job very well. But beyond the other accusations, I can't corroborate them. And I don't think anybody else here can corroborate them with what's been presented thus far to us. So, and I think the public should keep that in mind. When you hear these things and you hear these discussions being had, keep that in mind. The other thing that I want to state is there was another speaker earlier this evening who brought up the fact that, in his opinion, our board president had a conflict of interest. Well, I can tell you for a fact that having been the vice president of this board, I had had another corporation council look into it, and there is no conflict of interest there for Alderman Wilshire to be chairing that committee. And it's been, that is another horse that's been beaten to death. And that is another political tirade of someone who knows that there's an election around the corner. So, you know, I've had enough with this kind of stuff. We need to leave the politics out of here and we need to do what's right for this city. And we need to start doing it now. Alderman Dowd. Yes, <clears throat> the reason I brought up the challenge is because I've been on labor relations boards before who have the hiring and firing capability. And when we have personnel issues, they're discussed in non-public for very good reasons. And I was concerned that something was going to be said on one side or the other that was going to jeopardize anything that a special investigator might have to do. So this is not the place to discuss it. There's a special investigator that's been hired, and that's where it should stay. It should not be being discussed at this meeting. All right, committee announcements. Alderman Dowd. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow night is the uh, first budget wrap-up, and it's, uh, I'd like people to be prepared if, they're have, if they have any motions that they want to entertain, please have them be written out in advance and, and be as specific as you can. Uh, I can't say it'll, any of them will pass, but if they do, um, then the full board, the budget committee will get the vote on it, and if a majority of the budget committee uh, feels it's okay, it will go forward. Uh, once we pass the budget to the back here to the full board of aldermen, um, it will take the form of of a modification to the mayor's budget if we make those modifications. And just to remind people, when it comes back to the full board, if it's an increase in the mayor's budget, it's going to take 10 votes. If it's a decrease, it's eight votes. So just want to let you know that. And um, if anybody, I know some of the members of the budget committee have been talking to department heads. If there's any information you've collected that's associated with a motion you're going to make, I would prefer that you give that information to the entire board as soon as possible so that they will have that information to make their decisions on. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, through you to uh, Alderman Dowd. Will um, Treasurer for Debt be there tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Uh, this is at the bud you're at you're yeah. at the budget committee wrap up? Yeah, if you'd like them. I think I think that uh, I would. I will be there as well as 
treasurer for debt and <laughs> Mr. Griffin. Great, thank you. It might be a good thing to have the CFO as well. Yes. Yeah, he said that. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Karen. <laughs> Personnel will be meeting Monday already, June 3rd at 7 o'clock. Alderman Jetty. I, have, I, I do have a question of uh, Alderman Dowd, if Certainly. I could. So is, is this, is tomorrow night's meeting limited to any part of the budget, or is it the whole budget? Uh, tomorrow night? Uh, you... <laughs> I mean, when we're done, and we'll be passing on the entire budget, but if you have any motions relative to any part of the budget, it would be for that specific part of the budget. Hypothetically, if you have Department X and you want to add $10,000 to it, um, then I'm going to ask the CFO, does that, what does that do to our end budget number? Uh, and without any other changes, that would be above the mayor's budget. So anything going forward would require 10 votes of the full board. But yes, you can you can make a recommendation on any part of, of the, the budget. Is, and I would hope that there's some rationale behind the decision. Thank you. Any other committee announcements? <laughs> Alderman Kelly. Alderman if I could just follow up on his question. So we didn't go into wrap-up sessions last year. We, we were just when we passed it. So what what's the cutoff? You have one for tomorrow, and then you have one on Thursday. Like, is it a time? Or just wondering what the I'm hoping was. we wrap it up tomorrow. The reason I agree. With I, I'm with you. <laughs> the reason okay. I scheduled other meetings is in case we don't wrap it up tomorrow, because we have a very busy calendar, and... With Ms. Lovering, Mrs. Lovering, we uh, blocked off dates so we'd make sure we had them. But I would prefer that we wrap it up tomorrow because I'd like to bring it back to the full board and have it passed at the uh, June 11th, I guess Tuesday, June 11th, yes, uh, full board meeting because we have to get this passed in June. And that's getting awfully close. Okay, and no other committee announcements. Go ahead, motion. Alderman O'Brien. Adjourn. Motion is to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And we are adjourned at 8.57 p.m. Thank you, everyone.